My name is Dr. Johan Hoeg, and I'm a nephrologist and intensive care specialist working in Antwerp, Sternberg Hospital. Uh, I want to thank the organizing committee to invite me to talk to you about sodium profiling. Sodium profiling is a technique uh, during dialysis where we change the dialysate sodium to prevent certain specific interdialytic symptoms like hypertension, muscle cramp, and this equilibrium syndrome. If you want to understand sodium profiling, then first we need to understand how the sodium is distributed in our bodies of our end-stage renal disease patients, how the sodium in a diazid uh, during renal replacement therapy affects these stores, and how to safely implement sodium profiling. The normal kidneys excrete water and sodium throughout the day. So our total intake, intake is excreted 24 hours, seven by seven. By this means, we reach homeostasis and an osmotic equilibrium throughout all fluid compartments. However, in patients with end-stage renal disease, this is not the case. Especially in our anuric patients, water and sodium accumulate um, during a 44-hour interval and then we use a four hour or three hour dialysis three times a week to excrete this. Um, I don't have to tell you that this is not a very physiological, physiological state and that this can cause certain symptoms like hypotension. Fluids accumulate in the patients in primarily the extracellular fluid compartments. Cells have the ability to maintain their volume status for prolonged states, for prolonged state of time but it's the extracellular fluid compartment that has a storage capacity. Um, we've monitored this, this with, um, with bioimpedance studies, trace dilution studies, and we can tell that an expansion of the extracellular fluid compartment in our dialysis patients is responsible for hypertension, impaired cardiovascular status, and edema. More recently, we've described a three pool system to describe the sodium distribution in the bodies of our end-stage renal disease patients. First and foremost, we have the, the extracellular sodium, which we all know, which is osmotically active, which has a slow exchange with the second part, the bone, but there's also a third part. And this third part is a tissue sodium, whereby sodium is stored in skin and muscle interstitium, binds to amino glycans and other enzymes, and this is primarily a water-free storage. So this means we have a, a hypotonicity in skin and interstitium, possibly causing hypertension and fluid storage. If you want to describe sodium dialysis, and most of the time we use roughly around the same concentration of sodium in both diazetans and, and plasma, then we need to understand that um, not everybody is the same. Um, roughly, we, not, generally speaking, we use the same sodium in a prescription as the sodium is concentrated in the plasma of the patient. However, each prescription needs to be adjusted based upon inter-individual uh, differences in weight gain and sodium levels. This is easiest in patients who are stable and non-monotremic, but this is, as we know, not always the case. During renal replacement therapy, we have two general mechanisms to affect and remove sodium. And the first is convection. Convection is when we apply a pressure gradient across a membrane, um, causing removal of excess water and sodium. This ultrafiltrate we remove through the membrane has roughly the same amount of concentration of sodium as in plasma. Generally speaking, around 140 millimoles per liter of sodium. The second mechanism is the effusion. And the effusion is where we use an osmotic gradient applied across the membrane. So small molecules can equilibrate on both sides of the, of the membrane uh, to achieve equilibrium. In the dialysis, 97% uh, of sodium is available 
for osmosis. In the plasma, however, you also have larger molecules, proteins, sodium can sometimes be bound to these. Uh, and this is not always the case. So in total plasma volume, um, if we this, uh, uh, subtract the proteins, we remain plasma water. And in plasma water, uh, sodium concentration is 7% higher. So this would mean possible a sodium loss through the membrane of dialysis. This is partially negated by the gibbs dunham effect, whereby the negatively charged proteins uh, inhibits sodium traveling across the membrane. Theoretically, in a dialysis, sodium concentration should be 2% higher um, than that of the plasma to, to prevent sodium loss. But yet again, as I've described before, this is always different from patient to patient. If we would have a sodium gain in our patient, then it would increase plasma osmolality. It would cause a shift from the intracellular fluid to the extracellular fluid compartment, causing plasma refilling. And although this may prevent hypertension during renal replacement therapy, this would always be a cause of hypertension, thirst, patient drinking too much in between dialysis sessions, causing interdialytic weight gain. If you would have a netto sodium loss uh, after dialysis, and there would be a decrease in plasma osmolality, a shift of fluids from the extracellular compartment to the intracellular compartment, causing hypertension on one hand, but also less hypertension in between sessions. In a session, possible muscle cramps and even disequilibrium syndrome, the latter being a syndrome comprised of headache, vomiting, um, visual disturbances, brain edema, causing seizures, coma, and possibly death. During a dialysis sessions, when a patient presents with hypertension or muscle cramps, this is sometimes treated with saline boluses, often effectively so. But um, administering saline boluses during dialysis causes a gain in sodium, necessitating additional removal in the next session and thereby giving a vicious circle of having muscle cramps giving saline, and next time again, needing additional fluids removal. Hence, sodium profiling. In sodium profiling, the sodium content of the fluid is varied throughout the session. We start with a high uh, sodium in dialysate, thereby increasing the sodium in our patient's plasma, aiding in plasma refilling, preventing hypotension and muscle cramps, and during the, the, the session, during the dialysis session, we decrease the sodium in dialysis. So as to achieve a neutral sodium balance at the end of dialysis. Sodium profiling was developed to achieve benefits of higher plasma sodium levels at the start of dialysis without having a, a, a positive sodium balance at the end of dialysis. If we wanna be able to safely do so, the maximum difference in plasma sodium levels can be only five millimoles per liter. And we have to have this neutral sodium balance at the end of dialysis, otherwise we would have a uh, sodium gain causing extra problems down the road. There are three main ways of sodium profiling. The first and most widely implemented is a decreasing profile, where we start high but end low, as in the previous previous example. The high sodium at the end, in the beginning, sorry, increases plasma refilling, gives a better tolerance of ultrafiltration, and gives less hypotension. The low sodium at the end of the acid uh, prevents sodium accumulation. This is often combined with a similar ultrafiltration profile, where there's a high ultrafiltration rate at the start of the acid, where it's best tolerated, and the low rate at the end. We also have the alternating profile, which was developed in the late 60s to prevent this equilibrium syndrome. By an alternate profiling, ranging from high to low sodium throughout the session, as an improvement of transport of humic toxins through solvent drag. Less widely used is the increasing profile, 
where the sodium in diets increases throughout dialysis, preventing late hypertension, but also having the risk of sodium accumulation. Decreasing profiles has three main ways. We have the linear decline, stepwise decline, and the exponential decline. Linear decline should have less muscle cramps um, and stepwise decline, less hypertension, but these are small studies um, and not rigorously tested. It's been tested in various age groups and it has been advantageous in both young adults and in geriatric patients, but not so in children. Um, there have been few studies in children, but they show that there's a higher intralytic weight gain and a higher pre-dialysis sodium and blood pressure. This is an example of an alternating profile, whereby you change between high and low sodium throughout the session multiple times. And topmost example is an example where you see a change between 160 and 140, between high and neutral. And this is an example of an unbalanced sodium profiling, whereby you have a netto gain in sodium at the end of dialysis. The second example is a more balanced sodium profile, whereby you change between high and low. And at the end of dialysis, there's a neutral balance in sodium. Potential benefits, at least when done correctly, are a reduced incidence of disequilibrium syndrome, reduced incidence of hypertension, an optimal fluid and sodium removal, and less need for cell administration throughout dialysis sessions. There are, however, risks, and these entail an increase in pre-dialysis sodium concentration, thirst, weight gain, and hypertension. These are all the results of sodium accumulation um, and when you see that this is the case, then we would need to optimize our sodium profile. This leads me to one of the last topics of this talk being where do you go from here? Um, we can quantify mass sodium and water transfer using either equations or ionic dialysis, which is most promising, I tell you. Um, ion dialysis is where you have electrodes pre and post filter, continuously measuring the sodium in dialysis and comparing the sodium gradients. Uh, this way we can calculate the sodium loss and mass transfer and hopefully individualize our sodium prescription during dialysis. The second option is when we use sodium profile to combine it with blood volume monitoring and online clearance monitoring, but this all depends on the manufacturer and the software available to you. These are my references, which you can use for future directions. And I wanna thank you all for your attention and I wish you all the best and good luck in these troublesome times. Thank you very much.